Okay, I'd like as if we could this morning to turn to Ezekiel chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 7 into chapter 3 and down to verse 17. So we're going to be thinking in our session this morning about the hard-headed preacher. And so that's kind of our little title, the hard-headed preacher. Beginning of verse 7, it says, And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech, and of an hard language, but to the house of Israel." Not to many people of a strange speech and of an hard language, whose words thou canst not understand, surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impotent and hard-hearted. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads, as an adamant harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears, and go, get thee to them of the captivity, unto the children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, Thus saith the Lord God, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear. Then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. And I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them, and a noise of a great rushing. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Abib, that dwelt by the river of Kibar, and I sat where they sat, and remained there astonished among them seven days. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So he's been told that he is to speak God's words in verse 7, and also uh, to, to not be discouraged, just to speak it, whether they'll hear it or whether they refuse to hear, he is commanded to communicate the word of God and be persistent in presenting the word of God. And so that's his commission. But in verse 8, it says, But thou, son of man, hear what I say to thee. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat what I give thee. Of course, we, we see that uh, the nation of Israel were persistently rebellious. Uh, and of course, if you persist in rebellion and in rejection of divine light, there's an inevitable penalty. And even then, it is great sorrow to God's heart <clears throat> to have to bring judgment. Uh, and I just want you to see that although 
This message primarily is a message of judgment on the house of Israel, that it's not something that God particularly enjoys bringing. I want you just to notice, please, in Isaiah, just for a second, Isaiah chapter 28. Uh, this is uh, a message of judgment on the northern kingdom. And uh, it's telling them, of course, the, the Assyrian captivity. But in verse 21, you read a very interesting statement in Isaiah 28, verse 21. It says, For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perazim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work. And notice this phrase, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. And what we can discern from that is this, that, that judgment is God's strange work. The idea is it's, it's foreign uh, to the character of the one who acts. This is not how God likes to act towards his people. He doesn't enjoy that. Judgment is not something that he particularly enjoys. It's 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 foreign to his the character of the one who acts. He doesn't delight in judgment. In fact, just another scripture uh, that would affirm this, if you look at the book of Lamentations, again, another prophecy uh, on the uh, cusp of judgment, or, or so you say the aftermath of judgment, uh, Jeremiah lamenting because of what has happened. And yet he says in chapter 3, verse 33, for he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. What a great statement. God does not afflict willingly. So in other words, it's not something that he delights in, not something that he particularly enjoys doing, yet his holy character requires that he act in judgment on sin and rebellion. And to this extent, of course, it's not out of character. It's it's particularly foreign to his desire uh, when he has to act in chastisement on his own people. Again, when the Lord looked over Jerusalem uh, and thought of that day when the city would be laid waste by his enemies, we notice in Luke's Gospel, chapter 19 and verse 41, that we see something of the reluctance of his heart. And it says, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. So it's just good to remind ourselves that God doesn't relish judgment. It's his strange work. Uh, it's something that he has no delight in. But because his character uh, is s such a holy character that he, ultimately he has to do this. And, of course, we find that this whole book is a message of judgment. He's coming down on judgment upon his rebellious people because of their persistent rebellion against God. And so in verse 8, we said, said that this man, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like unto this rebellious people. First thing we could say is that the preacher needs to be different from the Re rebels who he is sent to. He needs to have a different life. And so he's saying to uh, Ezekiel, don't you be like them. They're rebels. They've been rebels for a long time, but you need to be different. Your message needs to be also backed up by a life that is different to those who you are speaking to. And again, it's very important to recognize, isn't it, that our life and our lips should be in sync, should be in harmony. If we're speaking of the holiness of God, then there should be some reflected holiness of character seen in the messenger. And when we look at the New Testament, I'd like us to look at First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, <clears throat> where we read this. <clears throat> it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. And the idea of that is that as we set apart the Lord God in our hearts, some translations have uh, set apart Jesus as Lord in your hearts, as we live out practical obedience to the Lord, uh, then he says, be ready to give an answer. In other words, people are going to see a significant difference in your life and be caused to ask questions. What is it about you that makes you different? And so, again, our prophet here 
He says, don't be, don't be like them. Don't be like the people you're going to speak to. You be uh, clearly different. And then he says, uh, and of course, this is <clears throat> how to be clearly different. And it's to do with the reception of the word of God. You see, rebellion is all about rejection of the word of God. It's hearing the message, but saying, I don't want it. But on the other hand, uh, a life that's transformed by the word of God is a life that takes in the word of God and internalizes it. And so he says in verse 8, Thou son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. In other words, the word of God has to become a part of the messenger. And when you eat something, it it's, it's taken in, it's digested, it becomes part of you. And that's the thought that's being conveyed here. It's going to expand on that a little bit. So we'll say, just leave it at that for now. We're going to expand on what that means practically as we go on. But he says in verse 9, When I looked and behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. So the only mention up to now that we've seen of a hand was the hands of the cherubim. And we saw that in chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, it says, uh, sorry, verse 8, it says, they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and therefore had their faces and their wings. And so the, that's the only reference we've had up to now. It's clearly the, the idea is this, the scroll is coming from God. It's the, his message because we're seeing speak my words unto them but remember that angelic beings are ministering spirits and so it would seem that this scroll came from the throne to the uh, hands of the cherubim and then the cherubim offered the scroll as the, as the only hands that are mentioned to uh, ezekiel and so it says uh that in verse nine, when I looked and behold, a hand was sent unto me. And again, that would that would again give that impression that this ministering spirit is sent. A uh, hand was sent to me, and lo, a roll of the book was therein. And so it's clearly from the hand of God, but through the intermediary of an angelic messenger. And so it tells us about this scroll in verse 10. He said, he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there was written there in lamentation, mourning, and woe. Now, usually, parchments were written on one side only. But here, the message of the Lord was so full of threatenings and woes that both sides had to be utilized in other words the message of judgment on this nation because of their persistent rebellion all god's indictments against them not only filled the the, the page of parchment but as they these scrolls would have been rolled like this it would have been on both sides of the scroll because there was just so much uh, that god had against them so both sides had to be utilized and so it tells us um that his message uh, that he has to to eat and to take in is a message of lamentation, mourning, and woe. And he's told to open his mouth and eat that I give thee. So he's got to take it and eat it, digest it. Now, we have the same idea in the book of Revelation. If you want to just turn there just for a second, Revelation 10. Revelation 10, lots of parallels between Revelation 10 and Ezekiel. And so Revelation 10 and verse 8 and 9, it says, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. So again, the very same idea. John was to assimilate the message, make it a part of him as he was to give out this message. And uh, it, again, it, it gives this, this idea of God's word being taken in uh, and, and made made 
his own. The, the, this message, preacher has to make it his own. It's got to be his message to the people, even though it comes from God. He's got to take God's message in, and it becomes part of his personality. In other words, preaching really is the mediation of divine truth through human personality. That's what it is, and that's what preaching is. So take it in, uh, make it part of you, and then give this message. Now, it's interesting how many times you have this picture of taking in the Word of God and making it part of you, not just in the head, but digesting it so that it becomes part of the the person. I want to just look at a couple of references. I know we're very familiar with them, but it's good to be reminded, Jeremiah, wonderful prophecy of Jeremiah and chapter 15 and verse 16. Jeremiah 15, verse 16, thy words were found, he says, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. And so your words were found, I ate them, and they were a joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Job 23, again, very great verse, very challenging verse. Verse 12, neither have I gone back from the commandments uh, commandment of his lips, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I, I've esteemed, I've valued his word more than my necessary food. That's become a priority, letting his word come into me and become part of me. And then the final one, of course, New Testament, uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4 and verse 4, where he says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so, again, the thought is that we should delight on feeding on his word. And uh, we we should ask one another, how did you have a good meal this morning? Uh, how was your spiritual breakfast this morning? Did you take in the word of God? Did you read it? Did you meditate on it? Did you allow it to come into your life and affect you? Are you affected by what you've read? It's interesting that in John's case, he talks about the sweetness of it, and we'll go into that in more detail in a moment. And certainly, uh, we're going to see the same thing for Ezekiel. It's going to be sweet. But in John's case, bitterness to his belly. Later on in chapter 3, we're going to see that he goes in the bitterness of his spirit, even though he's taken in the word of God. Of course, part of it is that the message that both Ezekiel and John had to deliver, even though it was God's word and it was a delight to him, we're told here, what kind of a message was it that he had to deliver? It was written there in Lamentations, Mourning, and Woe, end of verse 10. It's a message of judgment, a message of judgment on his own people. And so there's a certain sense in which God's word is such a delight to our soul. It's sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. And yet there's a there's a reality to divine judgment that is still hard, isn't it, for us to, uh, there's a bitterness to it because we could be speaking of our own family members, right? God is righteous to judge. He's holy. But people we love may one day be, those that come under that judgment if they persist in rebellion. And so you can see how this is not an easy message to deliver. And so there's a there's a dimension of bitterness. So chapter 3, verse 1, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, go speak to the house of Israel. Now, again, just another comment on this. This is actually a, a comment from F.B. Mayer, which I found very interesting. And he says this, it is especially incumbent on those who have to go forth and speak to open their mouths and eat the roll. There's no greater mistake than to suppose that because we are constantly handling God's word for the purpose of teaching and exalting others, we are therefore feeding on it for ourselves. It's possible to acquire an intellectual knowledge of the truth while the heart is entirely 
unaffected. And I think that's a very valid point that um, if you're involved in giving out the word of God, you can look at the scriptures almost as, okay, I've got to get a message for these people <laughs> and lose the whole point that God wants to speak first to you before he ever speaks to anyone else. And you need food for your soul before you can ever minister to anybody else effectively. And so it's very easy um, to become almost an academic in the way you treat the scriptures, almost like it's some, you know, you could be teaching biology or you could be teaching physics. No, no, this is the word of God and it has to affect the speaker before it will ever touch the hearts of the hearers. And so the, the point is that, and, and again, I find for myself, I, I jealously guard my own time with the Lord in the sense of reading just to know the Lord, nothing to do with preparation for Ezekiel messages or any other messages. Uh, I try to read the scriptures entirely apart from preparation, just for my own soul. Now, what I find is, as I read the scriptures for my own soul, sometimes I get messages, but that's not the reason I'm doing it. I'm doing it just for my the benefit of my own soul. And I think we've got to keep that before us all the time. And, but in this case, uh, he, he's told, eat this roll go, and then go speak to the house of Israel. So he says, so I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that roll. And so, again, it's not just a case of going into the ears, to the ears, but he's eating it. He's taking it in. Uh, it's becoming part of him. It has to be internalized, digested, uh, before he could be a messenger to the house of Israel. And um, we already said that that even though it was, it, it is sweet. Uh, there's a bitter dimension to it too. And of course. Um, Maybe part of it, even though what he had to take in was this idea of lamentation, mourning, and woe, it's still sweet because true submission will always find the will of God to be good and acceptable and perfect. Okay, Romans 12, 2. It's the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he said unto me, verse 3, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Just the same as John. It was like sweet to his taste when he, uh, like honey, uh, lots of other references to the sweetness of Scripture. we we'll just look at a couple of them. Psalm one, Psalm 19 beautiful psalm uh, about God's revelation and the different ways he reveals himself uh, in creation, in scripture, and finally in the Savior. And in chapter 19, uh, verse 10, he says, speaking of the word of God, it says, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Uh, psalm 119, again, another marvelous psalm about the wonders of the word of God. Verse 103, how sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And so certainly that sweetness of the word of God. And again, um, how is our appetite? Um, uh, again, we, we had a Spurgeon quote already from Brother Raymond this morning, but uh, here's one from Spurgeon, he says, if the word of God be not very sweet to me, have I an appetite? Solomon says, the full soul loatheth an honeycomb, but to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Then he says this, ah, when a soul is full of itself and of the world and of the pleasures of sin, I do not wonder that it sees no sweetness in Christ for it has no appetite. And that's a good to test ourselves, isn't it, on those things. How is your appetite for the word of God? Do you find that time that you set aside for communion with him and reading from him to be just a highlight to your day, sweetness, or as the busyness of life taken away the sweetness of the word of God? 
and uh, we just almost got used to it, maybe. By eating the scroll, Ezekiel would demonstrate his acceptance of the message without alteration. He'd also be accepting his commission from God. So he takes it in and he acknowledges that he is going to be God's messenger. He's taking it in, making it his own. Verse 4, he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee unto the house of Israel and speak with my words unto them. I want you to notice the prophet's ministry. Speak my words unto them. Don't proclaim your own opinions. Don't proclaim your own imaginations or thoughts. Don't proclaim a political message or pop psychology or your pet doctrines. You proclaim my words unto them. Un unedited, undiluted, you proclaim my words unto them. And again, um, we're not, not even dynamic equivalents, okay? In other words, not what you think my words are saying, uh, but my words. You know, there's a danger, in a sense, in the dynamic equivalent type translations of Scripture because the translator is saying, this is what I think the speaker was saying. Well, God is so exact, and the words are so important. A more literal translation is always the better option. And so in this context, uh, he says, speak with my words unto them. And who is the them? Notice it says, son of man, go get thee to the house of Israel. I thought Israel had already gone into captivity. I thought Israel were, were already in the Assyrian captivity and all we had left is Judah. But he says, to the house of Israel. And so why does he say, go speak to the house of Israel? It is interesting that in Ezekiel's prophecy, God in his eternal purposes sees an undivided nation. And the ultimate end of Ezekiel's ministry is a united kingdom, Israel and Judah, under one king. We'll see that when we get to Ezekiel 39. Uh, very evident there's going to be one nation uh, and uh, one nation under God, you know, not speaking of the United States, but speaking of uh, the nation of Israel, one nation under one king. That's And so, so he always has in view the entire people of God, although already Judah has gone into, or, or uh, the northern kingdom has already gone into captivity. He has the whole nation in view. Speak with my words unto them. Verse 5, for thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. Surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. So this idea of a hard language, not only the difficulty of understanding the words, but also includes the difficulty of dealing with different cultures, beliefs, backgrounds, the whole idea of cross-cultural ministry. And yet he says it's easier in some ways to preach cross-culturally to a foreign language speaking people than to God's people. <laughs> Be why is that? Well, because rebellion and rejection, rejection of divine light has a hardening effect. And because God's people have rejected light for so long, they have become so hard that he says it's actually easy, easier to go and speak to foreigners. Um, they, would, they would listen to the good news. But to Israel, they were so familiar with the message of God and God's prophets that familiarity had indeed bred contempt. And there, there's a danger that we're, we're so used to hearing the gospel, we're so used to hearing the word of God that we can almost take it for granted. I remember years ago hearing Warren Wiersbe say, whatever you do, 
don't lose the wonder of it all. And he's preaching on First John and talking about he is John, an old man, and he's still talking about events that happened decades ago as like it was yesterday. Everything was so fresh and real to John. Our hands have handled the word of life. And so he, he's, he was encouraging us. Brethren, don't lose the wonder of it all. Don't get, don't let it get old. Don't get used to it. Uh, pray that the Lord would keep the truths of God fresh and living and real to your soul. Uh, don't become stale towards the word of God. And so um, this is the problem. They they had lost the wonder of it all, the nation of Israel. They'd lost the wonder of having the glory of God actually among them. And they had exchange that as we heard earlier verse 7 he says but the house of israel will not hearken unto thee for they will not hearken unto me for all the house of israel are impudent and hard-hearted notice the emphasis by the way on the will here the house of israel will not hearken unto thee for they will not hearken unto me and again i really believe that's this is the key to whether somebody's going to respond or not, is it's in the realm of the will. Uh, Jesus understood this. The Lord Jesus in John 7, 17, I've often uh, used this scripture uh, because I feel like it's so key. If any man will do his will, in other words, if you have a heart that is willing to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. What's going to determine whether somebody's receptive or not is in the realm of the will. It's not to do nothing to do with intellect, it's to do with the will. Uh, one man said this, a man's will is his hell. It's easier to deal with 20 men's reasons than one man's will. And uh, it's so obvious, isn't it? Really, the will is the key. And um, if you're determined, you're not going to like it. You're not going to like it. <laughs> if you've already made your mind up, I, I, I find that in terms of even food choices and some things like that. A lot of it's a mental thing. I, I'm not going to like this. And so you're just not going to try it. But if there's a willingness, you might be surprised. <laughs> it might taste really good. Well, it's the same with the word of God. And so uh, those that will not hear have made their conclusions beforehand. Don't confuse me with the facts. I've made my mind up, <laughs> and it's done at the realm of the will. They will not listen to me. Now, of course, this must have been an encouragement in one sense to Ezekiel. He says, don't be surprised if they don't listen to you, because they, they're not listening to me either. And so, in other words, it's not, he's, he's telling the, the preacher, it's not your, your lack here. <laughs> they won't even listen to me. So don't be surprised if they don't listen to you. And so uh, God speaks not only from divine omniscience, uh, but also from long experience of Israel's refusal to obey his voice and his word. Uh, Stephen's sermon, Acts 7.51, says about them being a stiff-necked people, as your fathers were, so were you. This has been going on for a long time. The carnal mind, we're told, is enmity against God and has a tendency, Romans 8 verse 7, to resist God at every single turn. He says they're impotent, they're, they're hard-faced, they have a cocky disregard of others and of God particularly. They're hard-hearted, hard of face, hard of heart. This is who you're being sent to. However, he's encouraged, again, by the thought that if they're not going to listen to God, it's not a reflection on the servant personally. It's not a reflection on you, Ezekiel, and your ministry. Don't take it personal. Uh, this is it's me, actually. That And again, this is really important. Is that when we do, we do evangelism, you do door-to-door -door work, sometimes we can get so hurt and offended because we feel like they've rejected us. No, no, it's not you they're rejecting. It's the Lord they're rejecting, and they've long done so. So he says in verse 8, how's the Lord going to help this guy? I mean, what a terrible group of people to go and speak to. How's he going to cope? Well, he says, behold, he says, verse 8, I have made thy face strong against their faces and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant, harder than flint, have I made thy forehead 
Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. So this idea of adamant that's mentioned in verse 9 is literally a diamond. Very hard, native, crystalline carbon, valued as we know as a gem. And it it, it really is the idea, of it, of course, we, we see it in power tools. Certain power tools have a diamond-tipped blade, and it'll cut through concrete uh, like a hot knife going through butter. And so that's the idea. It's so hard. And so uh, when 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 we think of somebody like a diamond or adamant, it came to mean impervious, stubbornly unyielding, too hard to cut or or pierce. And so the idea is this: I'm gonna, I'm, you're gonna be the toughest, nuttest preacher on the planet, even though you're up against these people. And they're rebellious and all the rest of it. And, you know, they've already found out that they're, they're prickly. Uh, they've got a sting like scorpions. But you're going to be the tough nuttest preacher. And you're not in any way going to be intimidated by them. It's really interesting, isn't it, that two preachers are preaching at the same time. One to those already in captivity, that's Ezekiel. He's the tough nut preacher. The other one, to those that are yet to go into captivity, those that are still in Jerusalem, that's Jeremiah. One's a hard nut preacher. The other one is a big softy, right? Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He can hardly speak without tears running down his cheeks. And, and the point is simply this. God is using every means to speak to this people. If they need a message of tenderness with tears, he said, I'll provide that. If you need somebody who's just going to tell it like it is and confront you uh, with a with a with a uh, kind of a determined uh, will, I'm going to give that to you, too. And so the, the results were the same. God is going to great lengths to speak to his people and yet they're still refusing to listen. But he's going to give him this, this uh, diamond head, as it were. I made their forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks. And so, of course, uh, the looks can be a very difficult thing. And, and sometimes uh, when you're preaching, uh, you, you, you can see different looks in the audience. Sometimes you can see puzzled looks, which means you're probably not communicating. Sometimes... You see sleepy looks, which means uh, either they've had too much sugar or something's going on, or maybe you just need to be more energized. Sometimes you see defiant looks, and that's what he was going to see. He's going to see defiant looks. Don't confuse me with the facts. I've made my mind up, and there's this determined rebelliousness. And, um, and so one of the characteristics of his ministry, that because God gave him this diamond forehead, so to speak, he was able to outlast his opponents and not be worn down by their apparent intransigence. Jeremiah, as we've already said, he didn't have a hard head. He had a soft heart. And he couldn't stand up against all the trouble he faced. In fact, there, there came a time in Jeremiah's ministry that he was ready to quit. Uh, just look for a second at Jeremiah 20. He was so tender-hearted that he just he, he could hardly handle their persistent rebellion. And so verse 8, he says, For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoiled, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. In other words, he said, I'm throwing in the towel. I'm done. I've had enough of these people. They're not listening. They're not paying attention. He said, I'm, 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 I'm finished. But then it says this, But his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. And so he reached a point where he said, I just, uh, I'm ready to quit, but God's word was burning in him, and he couldn't stop. So God says to Ezekiel, the children of Israel are hard-hearted, but I'm going to make your head harder than theirs. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks. 
Of course, these looks, you can just see the looks of a rebel, the scowl, the, uh, you know, you can just picture it. It's very clearly uh, not a pleasant thing. So we, we get to verse 10 and he says, Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart and hear with thy ears. Again, we've already heard that he, he couldn't afford to be rebellious himself. So he, he has to assimilate the message before giving it forth. He must first preach to himself, let the words speak to his own heart before he could speak to others. And the command again is, all my words receive in thy heart. And again, that, that's the difference, isn't it, between the, the, the head. We receive messages in our head through our ears, but do they ever come and lodge in our hearts? And so... This is what he's told to do. Not just the general import of the words of the prophet must deliver, but the actual words themselves. God's purpose and message are precise and particularly leave no room for man's interpretation, demand the obedience of faith alone. And he has to engage both his heart and his ears. The heart must be touched by the words of God if the hearer is to obtain the benefits of them. Before the heart can be touched, the ears or the mind must be applied to listen and be instructed. There's no shortcut to understanding the will and ways of God. And this is what he's told to do. So in verse 11, it says, And go, get thee to them of the captivity unto the children of thy people, and speak unto them, and tell them, Thus saith the Lord God, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. So Ezekiel is left in no doubt about the call to service, since he's told repeatedly to go, not because he's delaying or anything, but just an assurance. I've given you this. You go. You you do this work. And uh, again, the the description of his audience is given to us here. Get thee to them of the captivity, which tells us of uh, these people. They're the the children, the sons of your people, the children of thy people. It speaks of the sad condition into which the people of God have been brought and of Ezekiel's close relationship with them. They're your people. You're with them. You're in captivity. You take the message to them. Again, we're reminded, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 3, preach the word, uh, tell it like it is, irrespective of the season, in season or out of season, preach the word. This is basically God's commission to Ezekiel. Verse 12, then the Spirit took me up. And I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing saying, blessed be the glory of the Lord from this place. So reminder to Ezekiel, once again, of the vision that he had seen in chapter one about the glory of the Lord. To encourage the servant, don't lose sight of the glory of God, Ezekiel, as you minister to these people. Keep in mind, this is what they've exchanged. This is what they've rejected. They've exchanged the glory of God and believed a lie. And they've, they've, they've worshipped the created thing rather than the creator. Keep that in mind. Don't ever lose sight of that. And he heard the voice, of, uh, he says, of a, of a great rushing. And again, we're not reminded of Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. There was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. And certainly the Spirit of God is taking him up. And so as a result of that, I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing. And of course, uh, saying, blessed be the glory of the Lord from this place. And so a reminder of the glory of God is encouraging the servant. Taken up by the Spirit, Ezekiel hears this voice. And so it says, so the Spirit lifted me up and took me away. So I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit but the hand of the lord was strong upon me again just we, we said the bitterness is partly because the message he has to bring of lamentation mourning and woe uh, to people that he loves and so it's a message of judgment so there's bitterness even though there was a sweetness in the message and he's going in the heat of his spirit, just uh, the whole man seen the glory of God, heard God's call. He's going, he's about to commence his ministry and clearly led by the spirit to do this ministry. And verse 15, it says, then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Abib that dwelt by the river of Kibar, and I sat 
where they sat, and they re remained there astonished among them seven days. He's about to start his ministry, and yet for the first seven days, he doesn't say a word. It's a bit like Job. Do you remember the, the comforters came to Job and they sat where he sat for seven days and never said a word? Well, same thing here. He's going to sit where they sit. It's a good thing for the servant of God to be among his people, to weep with those that weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, for he can better minister to them when he knows their hearts and feels their pain. And so here he is sitting where they sit. Their rebellious spirit, their sad condition, all of these things may have contributed to his silence. Uh, he's heard about how rebellious they are. He sees their plight, their sad condition. And so there he is sitting there. And of course, let's go back to Jeremiah just for a second in chapter 2, verse 13, where we read a verse that really kind of summarizes what the nation of Judah have done that brought them to this place. Jeremiah 2, verse 13, he says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. They've forsaken the fountain. So there's something missing. There's an absence. But there's also an addition. They've hewed out cisterns, <laughs> broken cisterns that can hold no water. They've tried to replace him with something else, with idolatry and rebellion. And that's their culpability. That is their crime. Now, in the remaining couple of minutes, we want to just think about Ezekiel as a watchman in verses 16 and 17. He's appointed to be a watchman. So it says, verse 16, it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. So primarily, the ministry of Ezekiel is a watchman on the walls to Judah. If you look at Ezekiel 33, and we'll get there eventually, but it's a very similar uh, passage. Uh, it says it again in <clears throat> verse 1, again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, say unto them, when I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their course and set him for their watchman, and when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. And so that's the idea. It's this idea of a watchman. He's been appointed to be a watchman. Now notice as well, as we, we'll expand more on this idea of a watchman in a second, but notice also that in this verse, it says, It came to pass at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, This is the first occurrence of 41 occasions in the book of Ezekiel where he will be told or we will be told the word of the Lord came unto me. And so what we could say is this, no other prophet it is ever said other than Ezekiel that he had such sustained contact with the divine word. In other words, it says it of him more than any other prophet. The word of the Lord has come unto me, say. And so 41 times, it's just like again and again, God's word comes to him and he delivers his message, a sustained message from God. And so then he says, I've made you a watchman. A watchman, as we know, would stand on the walls of a city and keep his eyes peeled for the approach of an enemy. If he saw the approach and warned the people he had discharged his responsibility. However, if he failed to warn, he would be held responsible. If he warned and they paid no attention, 
they're still responsible. He's done his duty. His job is to stand on the walls and watch. And so he's, in a sense, what we call the lookout. He's scanning the horizon. He's checking for enemies. He's watching carefully. And, of course, the safety of the entire population res rested with the watchman. If he didn't do his job well, then there would be calamity. Disaster would come upon them. And just a couple of references where we see this ministry of watchmen uh, in Scripture. First in Samuel, Second Samuel, uh, where we have an example of it. And then we'll see another one in Second Kings. Second Samuel 18. Verse 24, 2 Samuel 18, and verse 24. It says, And David sat between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate unto the wall, and lifted up his eyes, and looked, and behold, a man running alone. And the watchman cried, and told the king. The king said, If he be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. And he came apace and drew near. And the watchman saw another man running. And the watchman called unto the porter and said, Behold, another man running alone. And the king said, He also bringeth tidings. And the watchman said, Methinketh the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimahaz and the son of Zadok. And the king said, He is a good man and cometh with good tidings. So again, just to say, a watchman, peeling eyes peeled along the horizon looking for someone uh or an enemy coming or maybe a messenger or whatever second kings same idea second kings chapter 9 verse 17 it says and there stood a watchman on the tower of jezreel and he spied the company of jehu as he came and said, I see a company, and Joram said, Take a horseman, send to meet them, and let him say, Is it peace? So there went one on horseback to meet him, and said, Thus saith the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What hast thou to do with peace? Turn thee behind me. And the watchman told, saying, The messenger came to them, but he cometh not again. And so he goes on and describes the story. But again, we just have examples. A watchman on a wall, scanning the horizon. Ezekiel was not to be a watchman for a city, but for the entire nation. Ezekiel was to warn the people of what was coming and to make them aware of the times in which they were living, to warn them of impending judgment. In contrast to Ezekiel's ministry, there were false prophets who failed to warn Israel. In fact, their message was a message of peace. Peace when there was no peace. They would suffer the consequences of judgment from the Lord for their failure to warn when it was needed. And of course, in the New Testament, there's an application, isn't there? There certainly is a coming judgment. And as believers, we have a responsibility to warn mankind to flee from the wrath to come. The Apostle Paul, if anybody ever discharged his responsibility as a watchman, it was the Apostle Paul. In fact, he said this in Acts 20, verse 26. He says, I am pure from the blood of all men. In other words, I have discharged my warning. In fact, Acts 20, 31, I've done it night and day with tears. He was a faithful watchman. One last thing that we'll mention, and that's, the responsibility of shepherds in the assembly to be watchmen to the local assembly. Hebrews 13 and verse 17, interesting scripture, but again, this role of a watchman giving a warning. Hebrews 13 verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls, as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is an unprofitable unto you. So shepherds in God's assembly also to be on their watch, watching for the enemy's attack, seeking to protect the flock of God, warn of imminent danger that might threaten her peace and safety. 
The word watch here means to be sleepless. And so it's an, kind of an interesting picture. But our time is gone. And uh, again, what a challenge for us in our day to be watchmen to our generation. Amen.